Turn with me in your Bibles to Exodus 28. As we've been looking at this amazing book of Exodus, God has been speaking to Moses about the law, about the building of the tabernacle. He's been very specific about what needs to happen there, about all the sacrifices that they will need to carry out. Uh, the reason this is so important is because this was God's requirements for the children of Israel to have their sins dealt with in order for them to come into a relationship with the Lord. Now Moses will spend 40 days and 40 nights on top of Mount Sinai as he receives all of these very detailed instructions from God. And God is very clear, you must make everything according to the pattern that I have shown you. You must make everything according to the design I'm giving you. In other words, Moses must follow God's blueprints exactly as God tells him. Now, there is to be no improvising. There is to be no additions. There is to be no subtractions from what God is telling him. And once again, all these things point us to Jesus Christ. As we've seen, Jesus is the fulfillment of all these things. And in the same way, we must not try to change the nature and character of Christ. We don't add to his work. We don't take away from his work. We don't change anything about his nature and character. We must never add to his all-sufficient sacrifice for our salvation. He has provided everything for us. But unfortunately, the Jesus of the Bible has always had those who try to add to and take away from his true nature, his character, his plans and purposes for our lives. In other words, there will always be, there will continue to be individuals, false teachers, cults, uh, books, movies, even TV shows about Jesus that are nothing more than misguided attempts to create a different Jesus, a Jesus who was created after their own image, their own likeness of what they think Jesus should be. But again, that is so wrong. It is extremely dangerous because a different Jesus cannot save anybody. Only the Jesus of the Bible can save us from our sins. So where do we find the only authentic Jesus? We've got to stick to God's pattern, His blueprint, which is the Word of God from Genesis to Revelation, period. Any other source that changes and distorts God's Word concerning Jesus, it's not from the Holy Spirit, it's from Satan himself. Satan is a liar, he's the father of lies. Satan is the one who came into the Garden of Eden and lied to Adam and Eve. Oh, surely you won't die, you'll become just like God. And God has given us everything that we need to know about His forgiveness, about salvation, about eternal life, and it's all wrapped up in Christ, and He is revealed throughout the Word of God, from Genesis to Revelation. That's why we need to test all things that we read, test all things that we watch, test all things that we hear. Make sure you run all things through the filter of the whole counsel of God's Word. That, that refers to what I teach as well. You know, Paul commended uh, the Bereans because they didn't just take Paul's word, even though he was an apostle, they searched the scriptures to make sure what Paul was saying about the Jewish Messiah actually lined up with the Old Testament scriptures. Acts 17.11 says this, there were, uh, These were more fair-minded or noble-minded than those in Thessalonica in that they received the word with all readiness, and search the scriptures daily to find out whether these things were so. And like the Bereans, we need to do the same thing. After all, God's word is the final authority on what is true, not anybody's personal opinion on what they think is true about Jesus, but it's God's word. Now, as we come into chapter 28, <clears throat> God will focus on uh, the ministry and the requirements of the priesthood. Specifically, God will focus on telling Moses, these are the things you're going to tell Aaron and his four sons. They will serve in the tabernacle. They'll teach the truth about God's law. They must be very exact on how they lay out all the sacrifices. Now, again, the role of the priest was twofold. They were to represent God before the people, and then they were to represent the people before God. Now, that was a huge responsibility. They were to accurately teach God's word and his ways to the people. And then in turn, they would intercede 
on behalf of all the people before holy God. And so if they misrepresented God in any way, they were in big trouble with God. We know, and many of you know, when you get to Leviticus 10, two of Aaron's sons, Nadab and Abihu, it says they offered up profane fire before the Lord in the tabernacle and God struck them dead. That's how serious God took their responsibility as priests. This is one of the reasons why James 3.1 warns us, My brethren, let not many of you become teachers, knowing that we shall receive a stricter judgment. And so whether you're an Old Testament priest or a New Testament pastor slash elder, God holds us accountable so that we need to be careful with his living word. Paul tells Timothy, his son in the faith, in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 15, Be diligent to present yourself approved to God, a worker who does not need to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. And we're seeing that lacking in so many churches today throughout the world where they don't rightly divide the word of truth. They make up things as they go. They make things say what they want it to say, not you know what God's word says. So we need to be very careful with the word of God. So let's take a look at what God says about the Jewish priesthood. Chapter 28, look at verse 1. It says, Now take Aaron your brother and his sons with him from among the children of Israel, that he may minister to me as priest, Aaron and Aaron's sons, Nadab, Abihu, Eleazar, and Ithamar. Now Aaron would be the first high priest in the, the, you know, for the people of Israel. He'll be called into that unique position of being a mediator between the people and the Lord. He alone will go into the Holy of Holies once a year with the blood, sprinkle it on the mercy seat, making atonement for the sins of all the people. Again, once a year, a temporary covering. So 1,500 years before Jesus comes on the scene, God is already putting into the hearts, into the minds of the people of Israel that their Messiah will not only deal with the sins of the people, he will be the mediator. He will be the one that will intercede on behalf of all the people. Again, Jesus will fulfill all of these requirements. Uh, Hebrews 3 verse 1 says this, Therefore, holy brethren, partakers of the heavenly calling, that's all of us, consider the apostle and high priest of our confession, Christ Jesus. He is the ultimate final high priest. Second, uh, 1 Timothy 2 Verses 5 and 6 says this, For there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself a ransom for all to be testified in due time. Jesus is very emphatic about this truth when he tells um, Thomas, this is in um, uh, John 14, verse 6, Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. And so that statement alone rules out the need for any priesthood today. The Catholic Church is not of the Lord because those priests cannot represent God in the way God intends for us to be. They intercede on behalf of the people. They'll say, you have to go to the priest and confess your sins to the priest. Or you have to go through Mary, confess to her because Jesus is too busy. Or you have to go through one of the dead saints. I mean, that is an abomination to who Jesus Christ is. He's the one true living God. After all, Jesus forgave us of our sins. Only his blood can cleanse us of all unrighteousness. Now, with the nation of Israel, they would have only one high priest at a time, but they had many priests. The, the tribe of Levi would be the one tribe that would be like the spiritual leaders over all the other tribes of Israel. Today, again, Jesus is the final high priest. But every one of us as followers of Christ, whoever is a saint, you're either a saint or you're an ain't. There's no in-between. You're either in Christ or you're not in Christ. But if you're in Christ, you are called a priest. This is what 1 Peter 2, verse 9 tells us. This is of the Lord's church. But you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people. And here's why. 
that you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. So we are to reflect as missionary priests, in a sense, the true nature and character of Christ. We represent him to a lost and dying world around us. Jesus is working in us. He's working through us. But we have a priestly missionary role in the world. We tell people the good news about Jesus. But we do not mediate between God and man. Only Jesus Christ does. Let me say one more thing about this verse. This is a great example that God chooses imperfect people to do some amazing things for the kingdom of God. Because here he mentions Aaron. He mentions his four sons. Before Moses even gets down off the mountain after 40 days and 40 nights with the Lord, Aaron is going to make a gold calf, and the people will begin to worship it, and God will strike down 3,000 people. Not a good way to start your ministry as the high priest. He'll strike down Nadab and Abihu once again. But even before Moses goes down the mountain, God knew all along Aaron is going to blow it. And by the time Moses gives all these instructions to Aaron, Aaron is going to be very humble. He will be very you know, broken because he has seen what his sin has done. And so he's got a whole new perspective. He's made keenly aware that he does not deserve to be in that role as the high priest. But that ministry Aaron has, it's another great example of God's grace. Because none of us deserve to be you know, doing anything for the kingdom of God. We're all sinners saved by God, by the blood of the Lamb, Jesus. The Apostle Paul probably understood this more than just about anybody because before Paul got saved, it says that he would have Christians, well, they were Jews who had come to Jesus, he would have them thrown in prison. He would have some beaten. He would have some of those followers of Jesus put to death. So Paul knew what he deserved. He deserved the lake of fire. But this is what Paul says in 1 Timothy chapter 1, starting in verse 14. And the grace of our Lord was exceedingly abundant with faith and love which are in Christ Jesus. This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am chief. So don't say, well, I've sinned so much, God can never use me. No, he's the chief. We're just little Indians. You know, he sinned more than anybody, Paul says. But this is why. He says, however, for this reason, I obtained mercy that in me first, Jesus Christ might show all long suffering or patience as a pattern to those who are going to believe on him for everlasting life. Again, if, you know, Paul's saying if Jesus could save somebody like me, he can save anybody. He can save anybody. There, there's nothing that you can do that is beyond God's grace and mercy and forgiveness if you'll humble yourself and confess your sin to Jesus and turn your life over to him. If Jesus can save somebody like Paul, he can do amazing things through those of us who will turn our lives over over to him. And, and the Bible is full of examples of how God used flawed people to do above and beyond anything that we could ever hope or imagine. And he's done more in my life than I could ever imagine. You know, I was just a real turd before I got saved. I got to qualify something. My head's a little fuzzy. So if I say something stupid like I just did, <laughs> I'll blame it on the antibiotics I'm on. So anyway, I was a big turd, you know. <laughs> And if God can use me, he can use anybody. I'll hear about that later, I'm sure. <laughs> but you look at 1 Corinthians chapter 1, and, and Paul goes through this list. God didn't choose many wise, many noble, many mighty. He chooses the foolish things of the world to confound the wise, he says. And the bottom line is, he does it because nobody can glory in God's presence. God gets all the glory because we know that we're nothing apart from the Lord. Anyway, let's look at verse 2, because we've got to cover the whole chapter. And you shall make holy garments for Aaron, your brother, for glory and beauty. So you shall speak to all who are gifted artisans, 
whom I have filled with the spirit of wisdom, that they may make Aaron's garments to consecrate him, that he may minister to me as priest. And these are the garments which they shall make, a breastplate, an ephod, a robe, a skillfully woven tunic, a turban, and a sash. So they shall make holy garments for Aaron your brother and his sons, that he may minister to me as priests. So take note, in these first four verses, three times God tells them that he's doing these things, that he may minister to me as priest. God does not say, I'm doing these things so that Aaron can minister for me. He says, I'm doing these things so that Aaron can minister to me. In other words, first and foremost, Aaron was serving the Lord. His number one priority was in his relationship with the Lord. How did he do that? How do we do that? We're to minister to the Lord. Well, we spend time in his presence. We spend time in devotions with the Lord. We pray. We seek his face first and foremost. We study his word. And only then, after that, can we effectively minister for the Lord. Again, we were created for fellowship with the Lord. He did not create us to be a bunch of hired hands. But he created us for fellowship. But what flows out of our lives must come out of a heart that has been touched by God, that has been filled with the Holy Spirit, that has been filled with the love of Jesus. C.H. Spurgeon said it like this, I must see the face of Jesus before I ever see the faces of men. In other words, Jesus is the source of love, compassion, truth, and we can't give to others what we haven't received from the Lord ourselves. We see a great example of this. Look at these, this verse, Acts 13, verse 2. As they ministered to the Lord, not for the Lord, as they ministered to the Lord and fasted, the Holy Spirit said, Now separate to me Barnabas and Saul for the work which I have called them. So it was out of their ministering to the Lord that the Holy Spirit called them into service for the Lord. Again, we see in these four ver or in verse 4 here these various priestly garments that Moses was to make. Actually, these gifted artisans were going to make these various garments. But it says God would fill them with the spirit of wisdom. They're not coming up with their own ideas. Again, they're not adding to or taking away from, but they're listening to what the Lord says through Moses, and then they're going to fulfill exactly what he says, but it's because God put the spirit of wisdom upon them. We'll see this as they make all the furnishings later on, that God puts the Holy Spirit upon these various people that are doing this work, and only then could they do what God called them to do. Now, notice these are holy garments, and they were anything but drab and boring. In fact, the, the garments that you know the, the Aaron would make, it says in verse 2, they were for glory and for beauty. So these garments were made from the same materials as what went into the inner part of the tabernacle itself. They were colorful. Um, those colors that the priest would wear would remind people of heaven, just like the inward part of the tabernacle. Uh, they would see the goodness of God. They would see you know, that God loved them, and they'd be attracted to the Lord. So let's look at the first garment. It's known as the, uh, the ephod. It's an ornamental vest. Verse 5, you can put that picture up. So, I'll talk about this here in a moment, but usually when you see ephod and the breastplate, they've combined them together, which basically is what God will tell them to do. But first they make the ephod, and the ephod is underneath the, the 12 jewels you see there. You see the top shoulders, that's part of the ephod as we'll look at. Look at verse 5. They shall take the gold, blue, purple, and scarlet thread and the fine linen, they shall make the ephod of gold, blue, purple, and scarlet thread and fine woven linen, artistically woven. It shall have two shoulder straps joined at its two edges, and so it shall be joined together. And the intricately woven band of the ephod which is on it shall be of the same workmanship made of gold, blue, purple, and scarlet thread and fine woven linen. You shall take the two onyx stones. So on the shoulder, you see the two onyx stones, one on each side, and engrave on them the names of the sons of Israel. Six of the names on one stone, and six names on the other stone in order of their birth. 
So it starts, you know, on the one side with the eldest son all the way down to Benjamin, the youngest son. And so it says, uh, with the work of the engravers in stone, verse 11, like the engravings of the signet, you shall engrave two stones with names of the sons of Israel. You shall set them in settings of gold. You uh, shall put the two stones on the shoulders of the ephod as memorial stones for the sons of Israel. So Aaron shall bear their names before the Lord on his two shoulders as a memorial. You shall also make settings of gold, and you shall make two chains of pure gold like braided cords and fasten the braided chains to the settings. So again, this vest went over the shoulders, held up by the gold chains. The settings, you know, were these two onyx stones were very important. One stone would have, you know, six names of the tribes of Israel. The other one would have the other six names on there. And this was symbolic of the high priest carrying the children of Israel upon his shoulders as he went before the Lord. This reminds us that any ministry we do for the Lord is work because they would be working as they were serving the Lord. 1 Timothy 3 verse 1 says this. This is a faithful saying. If a man desires a position of a bishop or overseer, he desires a good vacation. No, no, he desires a good work. In other words, there's a lot of work to be done as we serve the Lord. But at the same time, it's the work of the Holy Spirit working in us and through us that enables us and empowers us to do what God has called us to do. He's the one that keeps us strong. He gives us his strength, his power to serve him the way he calls us to serve him. If you do it in your own strength, you're going to quickly burn out. And I've talked to a lot of pastors over the years, and they're like, I've burned out. And that's always a sign that now you're trying to do things in your own strength and not in the strength of the Lord, because he keeps you going. 1 Thessalonians 1, verses 2 and 3 says, We give thanks to God always for you all, making mention of you in our prayers, remembering without ceasing, notice, your work of faith, labor of love, and patience of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ in the sight of our God and Father. And I know that so many of you here, you're doing a wonderful work for the Lord, but again, it's a labor of love, and it's wonderful. And I'm not just talking about those of you who volunteer and you serve in the children's ministry and worship and those things, but that includes all of us who are simply being light and salt in this world around us. It's a labor of love. The reason God uses you at your workplace, maybe in your neighborhood, wherever you are in school, is because he's put the love of Jesus in you and you want to share that love with others. That's the labor of love that he has for all of us. Now, this ephod also reminds us that we need to carry, we need to take everything and everyone to the Lord in prayer because when he would go before the Lord, he would have the the incense burning from the altar of incense, representing the prayers of the people and, and representing taking these prayers to the Lord. It also represents as he goes before the table of showbread, they take out the 12 loaves, they put the 12 new loaves there. And it's a thankful thing where he's going before the Lord saying, I'm thankful, God, that you're providing for the people of Israel. You're, you're meeting all of our needs. And it was a glorious time. We, we would thank the Lord for his forgiveness and the atonement for our sins as the, the high priest went there and sprinkled the blood on the mercy seat. So how did Jesus fulfill the ephod? Hebrews 7.25 says of Jesus, Therefore he is also able to save to the uttermost those who come to God through him, since he always lives to make intercession for them. Just like the high priest was making intercession for the 12 tribes, Jesus lives to make intercession for us. In other words, only Jesus has the power to save us and intercede for us. And just as Aaron carried the names of the sons of Israel upon his shoulders, Jesus bore the weight of our sins as he carried the cross beam upon his shoulders as he goes to Golgotha and he is crucified for us. A beautiful picture of this is seen where Jesus gives the parable of the lost sheep. Jesus, the shepherd, goes and finds the lost sheep. What does he do? He puts the sheep on his shoulders and goes back to the flock. 
That's the picture of Jesus carrying us on his shoulders. Let's take a look at the next garment, the breastplate. You can put that picture back up. This is the most noticeable thing, the breastplate. It's actually a square. This would go right over the ephod. But look at verse 15. You shall make the breastplate of judgment artistically woven according to the workmanship of the ephod. You shall make it of gold, blue, purple, and scarlet thread. In fine woven linen you shall make it. It shall be doubled into a square. A span shall be its length, and a span shall be its width. And you shall put settings of stones in it, four rows of stones. The first row shall be a sardius, a topaz, and an emerald. And these are all beautiful gems. This shall be the first row. The second, and each one of these represents the 12 tribes of Israel. The second row shall be a turquoise, a sapphire, and a diamond. The third row, a jacinth, an agate, and an amethyst. The fourth row, a beryl, an onyx, and a jasper. They shall be set in gold settings. And the stones shall have the names of the sons of Israel, 12 according to their names, like the engravings of a signet, each one with its own name. They shall be according to the 12 tribes. And so again, this beautiful breastplate, it's a span. The span is from your little finger to your thumb, approximately nine inches. It would be a square, about nine. So not very big, but this is over the, the chest, over the heart of Aaron. Twelve precious jewels, twelve names of Israel, the twelve tribes of Israel, each name upon those beautiful jewels. This would speak of the uniqueness of each tribe because God didn't make a bunch of cookie-cutter Jewish people. Each tribe was very unique, but it also speaks of how God looked at them, even though he knew they were far from perfect, they are going to stumble many times, but he sees them as precious jewels. That's very important to take note of. Even though they were so far from perfect, God did not see them as a rusty piece of metal or a dirt clod, you know, or just some ordinary rock. He saw them as jewels. And that's exactly how Jesus sees you today, as a precious jewel in his sight. Not as worthless dirt clods, not as rusty little objects he wants to discard, but as a special treasure, as a pearl of great price. Read those parables, and it's about him going after us, because he loves us. Paul was praying for the believers in Ephesus, and as he is, he's wanting them to know this important truth, Ephesians 1.18. He's, he's saying, he's praying that the eyes of your understanding being enlightened, that you may know what is the hope of his calling, what are the riches of the glory of, notice, his inheritance in the saints. In other words, you and I are God's inheritance, and he treasures us. He loves us. How do we know he loves us? Because he sent Jesus to die on the cross for our sins. But we are his inheritance, and he's looking forward to us being in his presence. Yes, we have an inheritance that we look forward to, and that's being with God for eternity. But we're also his inheritance. Now, not only did Aaron carry the people on his shoulder with the ephod, but he also notices with you know the, the breastplate, that's right over his heart. He's carrying the people over his heart. And that's an important thing for all of us to remember as we serve the Lord. We need God's love in our hearts for the people we minister to. Because to one degree or another, we are like messy, unkept little children in God's sight. And he can get very annoyed with us, but he doesn't because he knows us. We get very annoyed with others when we shouldn't because they're just like us. We're still in process. We're still growing. To one degree or another, we're just like the Israelites. But he never stops loving us. He never stops working on us. God is extremely patient with each one of us. And that is how we need to be with other people. We should only serve the Lord because we love the Lord, 
and we love other people. You know, I've heard pastors joke about it. Man, I love being in ministry, but it's just the people I can't stand. Well, then you shouldn't be in the ministry. You know, I've got to admit, people can be weird. Some of you are. People can be difficult. People can be difficult. Some of you are. They can be a problem at times, but they can also be incredibly sacrificial, incredibly selfless, incredibly generous, and God can do incredible things through all of us as we yield our lives to Him. Now, another thing that I see with God engraving their names in these stones is this. It's a sign that God would never forget them. It's a sign He's never going to forsake them. He's engraved their names in these stones. Like a signet, it's like the signet ring where the king would have his special signature on that ring and then they would stamp it into the wax and so nobody could open that unless you had the matching signet that would you know, match that. We're, we've been uh, signed, sealed by the Holy Spirit. That's God's stamp of ownership on us. And so he's given them this signet, this stamp, that they belong to me. There's no lost ten tribes. God knows exactly who his people are. In the book of Revelation, he even names the twelve tribes that he's going to use during the Great Tribulation to be evangelists for the, God, for, the, for the Lord during the Great Tribulation time. But this is a sign to them that he would never forget them. The same is true for you and me. If you're saved, God has your name written in the Lamb's Book of Life. And he's not going to take you out of the Lamb's Book of Life. Once it's written in there, it's been signed and sealed. You're, you, you've been over, you're an overcomer by the blood of the Lamb, Jesus. He makes his powerful promise. Look at this verse, Revelation 3, 5. This is a promise, not a threat. A promise to us, he who overcomes shall be clothed in white garments, and I will not blot out his name from the book of life. But I will confess his name before my Father and before his angels. Praise the Lord. He's not up there with a giant eraser waiting for you to step out of line and do something dumb. Oh, I sinned again. Whoop me, erase it. I'll write it back in later if you re No, your name's in there. He wants that relationship with us to continually grow. Well, look at verse 22. You shall make chains for the breastplate at the end, like braided cords of pure gold. You shall make two rings of gold for the breastplate. Put the two rings on the two ends of the breastplate. Then you shall take uh, then you shall put the two braided chains of gold in the two rings which are on the ends of the breastplate and the other two ends of the two braided chains. You shall fasten to the two settings and put them on the shoulder straps of the ephod in the front. You shall make two rings of gold, put them on the two ends of the breastplate on the edge of it, which is on the inner side of the ephod. And two other rings of gold you shall make and put them on the two shoulder straps underneath the ephod toward its front, right at the seam above the intricately woven band of the ephod. They shall bind the breastplate by means of its rings to the rings of the ephod using a blue cord. And this is where, over time, they basically became one, the ephod and the breastplate. Two separate things, but now they're together as one. So it's, uh, it is above the intricately woven band of the ephod so that the breastplate does not come loose from the ephod. So Aaron shall bear the names of the sons of Israel on the breastplate of judgment over his heart when he goes into the holy place as a memorial before the Lord continually. And so again, we see this joining, this linking together of these two very important pieces, the ephod and the breastplate. The ephod carrying them on his shoulders, the onyx stones. The breastplate carrying them in his heart, the 12 tribes of Israel. Again, a beautiful picture of the love and strength that our high priest Jesus has for us. He bears our names over his heart. So at times the Jews would rebel against the Lord, as you know. In Isaiah, this is during the time when the Ten nations are being taken into captivity because of their disobedience. And this is a beautiful section of Scripture, though, but in Isaiah 49, 
starting in verse 14. This is when the children of Israel thought that the Lord had forgotten them, that he had turned his back on them. Take note of this. But Zion said, this is referring to Israelites, the Lord has forsaken me. The Lord has forgotten me. But here's God's response to them. Can a woman forget her nursing child and not have compassion on the son of her womb? You know, even if that son turned into a little thing like I mentioned earlier, your mom is not going to forget you. You know, that, that love is always there. That's, that, and God's love is even infinitely greater than that. Surely they may forget, God says here, yet I will not forget you. See, I have inscribed you on the palms of my hands. Your walls are continually before me. What was inscribed on the palms of Jesus' hands? The nail prints. The holes were in his hand, the hole in his side, the holes through his feet. That was after the resurrection. That was the proof of his love for us. He still bore the nail holes in his hands. This is what we read in John 20, starting in verse 27. This is after doubting Thomas said, I'm not going to believe unless I can put my finger into the holes in his hands and put my hand into the hole of his side. I'm not going to believe. And so Jesus appeared eight days later. Then he said to Thomas, reach your finger here and look at my hands. <laughs> He's inscribed you on the palms of his hands. Reach your hand here and put it into my side. Do not be unbelieving, but believing. And Thomas answered and said to him, my Lord and my God. You know, the, it literally means the Lord of me and the God of me. You know, the JWs like to say, oh, he was just excited and he just said, my God, like a valley girl, oh my God. It's like, no, that's so stupid. He's literally saying the Lord of me and the God of me, referring to Jesus. Jesus Christ is God, come in the flesh. No matter how they try to spin it, you cannot take away from the fact that Thomas said, you're my Lord, you're my God. Jesus didn't rebuke him. Jesus said to him, Thomas, because you have seen me, you have believed, blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. When we first see Jesus, when we go into his presence, I think we're going to see him as the lamb that had been slain. When John, the apostle John first saw the Lord in glory, you know, it says, you know, the lion of the tribe of Judah. So he's getting ready to turn around expecting to see the lion. And it says when he turns around, he sees the lamb as though he had been slain, still bearing the marks of the crucifixion, still inscribed upon his hands, his love for us. That's the ultimate sign of his love for you and me, that he would willingly die in our place. Look at verse 30. And you shall put in the breastplate of judgment the Urim and the Thummim, and they shall be over Aaron's heart when he goes in before the Lord. So Aaron shall bear the judgment of the children of Israel over his heart before the Lord continually. And so inside the breastplate, there was this pouch, and they would put these two rocks in there called the Urim and the Thummim. They mean lights and perfection. Nobody knows exactly what they were, but what we do know is that when the high priest had a question of the Lord, like a yes and no question, he would go in there before the Lord. He'd pull out one of the rocks. A certain rock would mean yes. The other one would mean no. By the time Samuel passes off the scene, you no longer ever hear about the Urim and the Thummim. Joseph Smith claimed to have found them back in the 1830s. No, he didn't need them. He didn't, well, he didn't. Well, he was so far off the wall, it doesn't matter. But they, they faded from the record many, many thousands of years ago. In God's word, once it became complete, there's no such need for, oh, let's draw straws. Even Peter was doing that. Hey, who are we going to get to replace Judas Iscariot? Oh, let's draw straws. The lot fell to Matthias, so we'll pick him. God's like, you know what? I picked the Apostle Paul. I think that's number 12 when it comes to the 12 apostles. But be that as it may, we don't need peep stones or crystals or magic glasses. We don't roll the dice to figure out God's will. He has given us everything we need to know for his will for our lives through his word. He's given us the Holy Spirit of God 
and the word of God. So that's all we need to fall back on. Verse 31, it goes on to say here, you shall make the robe of the ephod all of blue, all of blue, not all of blue. That didn't make sense. There shall be an opening for his head in the middle of it, kind of like a poncho. It shall have a woven binding all around his opening, like the opening in a coat of mail, so that it does not tear. You got a picture of that? So that's kind of what the, all the blue there, okay? And upon its hem you shall make pomegranates of blue, purple, and scarlet all around its hem, and bells of gold between them all around, a golden bell and a pomegranate, a golden bell and a pomegranate, upon the hem of the robe all around, and it shall be upon Aaron when he ministers, and its sound will be heard when he goes into the holy place before the Lord, and when he comes out, that he may not die. So you see that, that's a good picture of it. You see the bell, gold bell and the pomegranates all around. Why would you need the fruit in between the bells? To keep them from being clanging noises. To keep them in harmony. You need the fruit. It's very important. Uh, the fruit was necessary to keep the metal bells from just clanging into each other. And this is a beautiful picture of how we are to operate in this world as Christians. Yes, we need to operate in the gifts of the Spirit, whatever gifts you have. Those are the bells. But what is more important than the gifts? The fruit of the Spirit. The fruit of the Spirit is most important. What's the fruit of the Spirit? Love. This is what Paul says. Uh, as you look at 1 Corinthians 12, it's all about the gifts. You look at 1 Corinthians 13, it's all about love. Chapter 14, all about gifts. Bells, fruit, bells, fruit, all the way around. 1 Corinthians 12, 31, Paul says, But earnestly desire the best gifts, so should we, we should all desire. God, give me what you have for me. I want to be you know, operating in the gifts that you have for me. Yet, I show you a more excellent way. The more excellent way is the way of agape, love. So the very next verse, Paul says, 1 Corinthians 13, 1. Though I speak with the tongue of men and of angels, but have not love, I have become sounding brass or clanging cymbal. Just a bunch of noise. The same with the high priest. If you didn't have the fruit in between the bells, it would just be clanging noise. If I got behind the drum set and started playing, you'd be going, ah, stop it. It'd be torture because I don't know how to play. It would just be clanging noise. It'd be very irritating. But you need the love that offsets. That, that's the harmony. That's where it comes from. So very beautiful picture here. When he would go into the tabernacle, they would always hear this beautiful sound of the bells and the fruit you know, hitting each other. It would just make a harmony. If it ever stopped making noise, that was a dangerous sign. Uh, it's not told in the Bible, but I think in the Mishnah it refers to the fact that they down the road they would start tying a rope to the high priest, and he would go in, he'd start serving, and they'd hear the noise. And if it ever stopped, they're like, uh-oh, God just struck him dead. And they'd take the rope and pull him out because nobody could go in there. And so they'd drag him out. Maybe that's very possible. That's what they did. But... The hint is here, so that he might not die. Verse 39, we'll wrap it up. Or no, verse 36, sorry. You shall also make a plate of pure gold and engrave on it like the engraving of a signet, holiness to the Lord. This is a big nameplate on his head. Do you, is that picture on the high priest? You see that one with the holiness unto the Lord? Does it even show that on there? It's on the front of his uh, headdress there. You shall put it on a blue cord that it may be on the turban, and it shall be on the front of the turban, so it shall be on Aaron's forehead, that Aaron may bear the iniquity of the holy things, which the children of Israel hallow in all their holy gifts, and it shall always be on his forehead, that they may be accepted before the Lord. And so this special hat, this turban, you can barely see it above his forehead, this plaque basically uh, I like to look at it as a bumper sticker holiness to the Lord if you put that on your bumper sticker or on your 
it has a bumper sticker on your car, I don't recommend it. I don't have bumper stickers on my car saying, Jesus loves you, because I don't want to be going, eh, eh, get away, you idiot. Oh, yeah, look at that bumper sticker. <laughs> Saves time. Saves problems. I used to have bumper stickers on my car, and then I get pulled over by <laughs> this cop. It was in uh, Nebraska, actually. We were, I was speeding. I, you know, I do that once in a while. And I got pulled over, and he's like, yeah, I like your bumper stickers. And he was actually a Christian, but he gave us a warning, so I guess that worked. I don't know. But if you're going to wear that over your forehead, holiness unto the Lord, you better be living right. You know, don't be a hypocrite. And so that was a reminder to Aaron. Everything you're doing is for God's glory. It's for him. It's not about yourself, but it's for holiness to the Lord. A constant reminder that God chose him to represent the holiness of God in all of his service for the Lord and for the people. And so, in all that we do, we should always desire for God to be glorified and for people to be edified. Verse 39, you shall skillfully weave the tunic of fine linen thread. You shall make the turban of fine linen. You shall make the sash of woven work for Aaron's sons. You shall make tunics. You shall make sashes for them. You shall make hats for them for glory and beauty. So you shall put them on Aaron, your brother, and on his sons with him, you shall anoint them, consecrate them, and sanctify them, that they may minister, again, here it is, to me as priests, and you shall make for them linen trousers. You see that word linen being used over and over again? There's a reason why. To cover their nakedness, that they shall reach from the waist to the thighs. They shall be on Aaron and his, on his sons when they come into the tabernacle of the meeting, or when they come near the altar to minister in the holy place, that they do not incur iniquity and die. It shall be a statute forever to him and his descendants after him. So you got these final garments, the tunic, which is a robe, uh, the, the trousers, it says, those are pants, the sash is a belt. And when all is said and done, you didn't see their flesh. They're covered. Just like you have been clothed with the robes of righteousness, God's not looking at our flesh. We don't want to walk in the flesh, we walk in the Spirit. We've been clothed with His robes of righteousness. Don't try to serve the Lord in your flesh. Um, Zechariah 4, 6 says, It's not by might nor by power, but by my Spirit, says the Lord of hosts. Notice also everything was made out of linen, not wool. Wool, they would be sweating their tails off. They'd be constantly just dripping with sweat. God wants inspiration to motivate us, not perspiration. He wants us to serve Him with a willing heart, a joyful heart. Yeah, work can be hard. Yeah, you can be on the mission field. You'll get sweaty, but you need to be inspired first and foremost. And that's what the linen represents because they were moving. It was cool. They're serving the Lord with joy in their hearts. It wasn't a heavy thing. They weren't all discouraged, but they're wearing these brightly for glory and beauty garments. Ministry can be hard, but again, it needs to be a work of love, a labor of love. If you're not loving God, if you're not loving the people, then you are not walking the way God wants you to walk. Jesus says, loving the Lord with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength, loving your neighbor as yourself, that fulfills all the law and the prophecies that we find in the Old Testament. 